One, two. One, two.
Yes, let's check on T. Check, check, one, two, check. Sound check, one, two, check. One, two, check. Sound check, one, two. Go sound. Sound check, one, two. Sound check, one, two. One, two, sound check, one, two. Eh? Sound check, one, two. Sound check, one, two. One, two, mic check, one, two. One, two, check. One, two. Check. What's up? conference so very well done so I know it's been a, a, a long day but now we are uh, finally ready to launch the uh, Kenya food security simulator tour so my name is Clemens Breisinger I'm heading IFRI's office here in in Kenya based in Nairobi um, and I'm extremely happy and pleased to be with with all of you uh, just a, a, a few small things. So first of all, I, I want to say how much um, at IFPRI we enjoy and appreciate the collaboration with uh, Kipra and KNBS. So this tool has been truly co-created. It's a, it's a joint baby, uh, if you want. And I, want, I also want to acknowledge um, the contributions of the CGIR initiative on national policies and strategies that made this collaboration possible. Now, I'll be the, the moderator uh, tonight. We'll try to keep all of this very focused, um, but because we know that the food is waiting. So having said that, I'd like to call on Rose, the executive director of Kipra, who of course you all know and doesn't need any introduction to give us a few welcoming remarks.
So good evening, everybody. Hello. I can see you're enjoying a, a taste of kilifi. I can see, inaitwa mandavu ama inaitwa nini? Ah, hata mimi sina, nataka hiyo. Eh, ni taste. So it's been a very busy day today and uh, we have all really enjoyed uh, our our interactions during the day. And uh, this evening um, we want to uh, demonstrate to you that uh, uh, as policy makers, as think tanks, as researchers, as uh, all of us in the space of uh, policy making, we really need to be prepared uh, in terms of having tools uh, for analysis. Uh, before I go on, let me appreciate my uh, keeper board, uh, the chair of the board, uh, uh, Dr. Benson Nateng, uh, all the board members, uh, all protocols observed because I can't uh, uh, figure out uh, who else uh, uh, with us. Uh, but I know that we have our good friend, uh, visitor from uh, Israel, and he's going to give us a lecture uh, this, this evening, just to tell us, uh, uh, as we talk about ourselves in Kenya, uh, what can we learn from uh, Israel, which I don't know whether it's an asal or it's an, an arid, or uh, whichever uh, uh, we want to do. Uh, before that, uh, also, I also want to appreciate uh, the IFPRI team, uh, led by Clemens, who is just standing next to me. Uh, and we have a story with Clemens. I think Clemens is the one who opened the office in Nairobi, Kenya. And when he opened the office, he visited uh, Kipra. And he... Uh, uh, and he he, he, he said he wants to work with Kipra. Uh, so we sat down, and I gave him a whole list of the things that uh, I would want us to do between Kipra and uh, uh, IFPRI. So with that long list, he went with it, and he came back uh, with what he was calling uh, the, the, wor the work group or workflows, eh? whatever they were. And uh, we were able to uh, really identify our priority areas. And one of the priority areas that uh, we had done, and of course it was uh, taken up by what we are uh, uh, doing today, we wanted to ensure that uh, we can track uh, expenditures uh, of government in uh, starting with the agricultural sector. Uh, but we were not able to move a, a lot with it because uh, we also have another program. It, mm -mm. We are not going to lose out uh, because of this. We need to uh, ensure that uh, uh, we can uh, uh, do something uh, that adds more value uh, to the institute. And he came up with this uh, uh, very interesting tool. Uh, he, he told me that time it was called micro simulation. Uh, but until now, uh, recently I found that it was not just a micro simulation. It was actually a food uh, security simulator. So as you sit here and wait for food, we are actually sim doing simulations, yeah? Uh, uh, you know, um, who then have uh, what kind of outcome uh, because of the diet that, uh, that we are taking. So in a nutshell, uh, now as, at Kipra, we have a new uh, tool that we can use to guide the government in achieving a key objective uh, of the uh, bottom-up uh, economic transformation agenda, and that is ensuring uh, we have food and nutrition uh, security. Uh, over and above that, we have done quite a lot with the IFPRI, including supporting us uh, uh, to prepare ourselves for the CG framework. Uh, recently, we were able to uh, finalize uh, the review and update of the socio accounting uh, matrix. Uh, thanks to K Clemens and uh, his team, uh, because right now uh, we have that tool.
but we shall uh, launch it tomorrow, not today. Today, uh, we want just to deal with the mi micro simulation, and tomorrow we shall deal with the, uh, uh, with the sum. And the updated sum is very critical uh, because uh, it will help us again to do uh, quite a, a lot of uh, a policy analysis, uh, quick uh, simulations uh, that again will guide the government uh, with the policy options. Chair and, uh, and voting members, Chair and the members of the board, Executive Director, invited guests, all protocols observed, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. A warm welcome to the launch of the Kipra Food Security Simulator. Welcome to the launch of the, of the Kenya Food Security Simulator in the sidelines of the Kipra Annual uh, Conference 2020-23. On the behalf of Kipra Board of Directors, I'm honored to stand before you tonight to launch this, this innovative tool that, we, that will play a crucial role in accelerating economic growth and development in arid and semi-arid land and beyond. Food security is a fundamental pillar of any nation's development agenda. In Asar regions where the challenges of climate change, limited resources and vulnerability to shocks are particularly pronounced Achieving food security becomes an even more pressing concern. It is therefore imperative that we invest in innovative solutions that can guide uh, policy makers, researchers, <laughs> practitioners in developing effective strategies to ensure that Food security, to ensure food security for all. Ladies and gentlemen, Kenya's food security simulator the Kenya food security simulator we are launching is a powerful tool that has the capacity to provide simulations for food, food poverty and food consumption. Changes especially in case of a certain price shock or introduction of new tax or unexpected weather event. This simulator, therefore, represents a significant milestone in Kipra and the, and the partners' effort to contribute to accelerated economic growth and development in Asal regions. It combines data models and advanced analytics to provide policy makers with a comprehensive understanding of the complex dynamics that influence food security. The use of, of this important uh, tool is of significant value given the recent development that severely have uh, put pressure on existing food systems. These developments include the Russia-Ukraine war, COVID-19 pandemic, climate change, among other shocks, which highlight the shortcomings of existing tools and models for public policy analysis. For Kipra, this is an additional tool for policy analysis.
Crucially, the simulator will enable Cupra and the partners to assess various scenarios, understand the impact of policy of uh, interventions, and make informed decisions to enhance food production, distribution, and access. This is happening to design, this is helping to design evidence-based policies that address the unique challenges faced by ASAR regions. And ultimately, <coughs> leading to improved food security and increased resilience of our communities. Ladies and gentlemen, that said, the Kenya Food Security Simulator is not, it's not just a, a tool for policy makers. It is a resource for researchers, academics, civil society organizations, and the stakeholders. It will serve as a platform for collaboration and knowledge sharing, enabling us to collectively explore innovative solutions share best practices and drive meaningful change. I would like to express my deepest gratitude to the, to the dedicated team at Kipra, our partners, and all those who have contributed to the development of this remarkable tool. To expert commitment and cooperation have made this milestone possible. And I commend you tirelessly, uh, I commend your tireless effort in developing this important tool. Ladies and gentlemen, as we launch this food security simulator tonight, let us remember that this is just the, the beginning. The real impact will be determined by how we utilize the tool to inform policies, shape interventions, and transform the lives of our fellow citizens. I urge all stakeholders to embrace this simulator as a valuable resource and actually engage in utilization to ensure that its full, its full potential is realized. In conclusion, I would like to thank all, all of you for joining tonight to celebrate this significant milestone. Together with this food security simulating simulation tool, let us, uh, let us forge ahead with renewed the renewed determination to accelerate economic growth and development in Asar region. Thank you and welcome. Simuyu, thank you so much for your very kind words. Now we have heard a lot about the Kenya Food Security Simulator. Now we want to see it. What actually is it? So for that, we have two IFPRI colleagues here uh, with us, Olivier Ecker and Andrew Comstock. Um, Olivier, please come up. Hands of, uh, hands of applause, uh, please. And Olivier will talk a bit about the background, and then Andrew will give us uh, a live demonstration. Thank you very much, Clement. Um, can we have the slides, please? Thank you very much. Um, thanks a lot for um, inviting us to launch this exciting tool here uh, at this uh, great Kibra conference. Um, so what I would like to do is I would like to tell you a little bit what is this tool about. And I want to start with a motivation. And I want to start fairly broadly. We know that food security in many countries around the world has been impacted by a succession of crises, as the previous speaker has pointed out. We had COVID-19, we had the impact of, of, um, of the Ukraine-Russian war and several other uh, following crises. Now, especially when crises hit unexpectedly, like some of these crises that I just mentioned, policymakers need to take quick action. To inform such action, Kibra, KNBS, and IFPRI, under the NPS initiative, as Clemens has pointed out, jointly developed this food security simulator uh, for Kenya 
to respond to that demand. We believe that this is an innovative tool for first cut evaluations of the direct impacts on households of economic crisis, but also the policy responses to such crisis in a timely manner. So the tool is designed in a way for assessing the potential short-term impacts of food price shocks and household income shocks. If you think about food price shocks, you can think of, let's talk about a positive shock. It could be that we release the restrictions for food imports, right? Then the price goes down. That we would expect has a positive impact on the consumers of this food, as well as uh, um, several other consumers for other products. Now, an income shock could be a positive income shock, could be a cash transfer given to certain to the poor, for example, that would also increase their income, and we would then expect that uh, they can afford um, better food consumption, a better diet quality, or other food insecurity indicators will improve. Now, in this tool, we do not only look at the national level, but we look at different population groups in Kenya, like household income groups by uh, rural and urban areas. I should also mention here that this tool is first launched here in Kenya and was developed for Kenya, but we also plan to develop that tool based on the experience made here with this great team uh, and roll it out in other countries in the next uh, years. Now, what are the features of this tool? First of all, I would like to emphasize that it's based on rigorous research including on a sophisticated food demand model to capture the consumer behavior uh, in, that, in that tool and in the response of this one. Of course, we published all these results. We have a, um, a documentation um, and methodology paper, a data paper at IFPRI, where we explain specifically how those uh, elasticities are estimated. Elasticities, as you, as you all well, well know, um, are a reflection of consumer behavior. Now, we have also specific, more policy-relevant documents where we discuss, you know, what are, what is a healthy diet, why is it so costly, and what, and why this limits, you know, Kenya's eating uh, behavior. That is what you can read in this IFPRI policy brief. Now, we have also another um, um, journal paper that explains a little bit more of the background. I would like to, again, emphasize that this tool is specifically designed together uh, with, with Kibra, KNBS, and of course uses also the data that were collected here in this country, and it's based on representative household survey ba data, spe specifically here the Kenya Integrated Household Budget Survey. It is an easy to use tool, as you will see in a second, because what we did is we developed it based on Excel interface, so that everybody who has access to Excel can also use this tool. It is also free for download, as I will show you in a second. And of course, so that everybody is well guided through this tool, we have developed a detailed user guide. Now, what does this tool? It allows the user to simulate certain shocks, and then it produces simulation results tables, but also concise overview tables and graphs for key indicators, so that they can then be used, for example, in uh, policy documents or in uh, presentations. Now, we will now have a live um, demonstration of this tool. If you want to access this tool, you can just scan uh, the QR code um, from the flyers on your table or directly here from uh, the screen. Thank you. And so, yes. <coughs> so yes, as my colleague mentioned, the, the idea behind the tool is that it is easy to use and has a simple interface. Can we get the, um, the screen up, not the slides? Oh, hold on, hold on. No. Okay. So the, the user interfaces with the tool by inputting either food price shocks on the sheet that says food price shocks or household income shocks on the sheet that says household income. This is all the user has to do. The idea is that it's very simple to use, simple inputs, but provides very concise, detailed tables for outputs, or we've also hand curated in a separate file a number of different graphs. Now you'll see right now, 
This is a graph of uh, undernourishment in, in Kenya. We have not simulated anything, so this is the baseline results. But let's say if we wanted to simulate a policy change of, say, an income transfer to the poorest household. We could go back to the tool. We would go to the, the household income uh, sheet. And we just go here, and we simply type 10% for rural, 10% for urban poor, and that's it. That's all you have to do. You don't have to click run. You don't have to click anything else. The simulation has now gone. And we can go back to our undernourishment sheet, and you can see that they now have a separate, a separate um, trend line for the simulated impact. And we can see for rural households, we've now seen that diets have improved for the poor, and we've seen that there's very little impact on, on any other households. There's a smaller impact in urban households. Now, what happens to food poverty? Well, since we've shocked incomes directly, we would expect to see a higher impact on, on the food poverty line, on, food, on households that are food poor, rather than just in flat consumption rates, and we see larger, larger gaps between the baseline and the simulation. I should note that the food poverty line here is based on the KNBS poverty line, food poverty line from the 2015-16 data that we're using, and the undernourishment figure is based off of the FAO information. So, simple example, we've now given poor households a 10% increase to their income. What if we wanted to do something a little different and we wanted to look at food price shocks individually? I'm gonna reset the simulation so that we're not doing two things at once. And we'll go over the food prices sheet. Here we have 20 different, 22 different food items that you can shock either by rural or urban for a positive or negative food price shock. I was told recently that maize was in the news and that it would be interesting to potentially look at what would happen if maize prices decreased nationally by 15%. Simple, easy, we put in negative 15, prices are going down by 15% in the simulation, and we can go back and see what happens. Well, we can see on food poverty, it maybe doesn't have such an impact from what we can see based on the trend lines. Undernourishment, now here, here, this makes a little more sense, you know, maize is a cheap source of calories, so maybe decreasing the price doesn't have a big effect on food poverty, but it has an impact on household consumption. Now maybe we want to think about how it impacts household consumption in a more detailed manner. Now we have a number of different other graphs, one of these being these figures of household consumption deficits. Now we we, in the background we've calculated how much a household consumes for each food group and we, we uh, put that in re relation to a reference diet and we see which, how many households are, are deprived of a certain food group. We can see that by the black line is the baseline, and by decreasing maize, just maize prices by 15% in one simulation, we've, in, we've helped improve the deficit gaps for households for starchy staples. But there are always trade-offs, and when you start shocking prices, you start dealing with cross-price shocks. And so we've also seen an improvement in fruit consumption, but a decrease in dairy consumption. So these, these maize price shocks have had a, an impacts that we may not have considered beforehand. We can continue down to other food groups, but I think you, you understand the picture. We also provide, beyond these graphs that we provide, we also provide some tables that provide detailed information on the changes from the baseline for food poverty rate, prevalence of under, undernourishment, and a number of other different statistics. And for those who are more interested in very detailed statistics, the main tool has detailed outputs for diet quality indicators. We've created our own uh, reference diet, qu diet quality indicator based on some previous literature we've published. And we have a number of adequate food groups, a number of different things. And if you scroll down with me, you can see we have all by all of these food groups, by different quintiles, different changes from baseline. You can really get into the weeds to kind of figure out, okay, if I shock this one food group, how are diets really changing in a diverse way at the household level? Um, all of these tables and figures have been formatted so that they're easy to export. We want you guys to do some simulations, take it, put it into a uh, PowerPoint presentation, put it into your reports. Everything prints off nice and easy. It's been formatted so that for most, as, as ease of use as possible. And I think I'm gonna stop here, but tomorrow we're gonna be at the booth all day doing live demonstrations. So if you have any other questions, any other simulations you're interested in seeing, interested in running, come by. If you, have, if you download it tonight and you have questions about how it works or how to use it, come by, I'll be there. I'm ready to answer any questions.
right, I hope you all agree with me that this is pretty exciting and innovative uh, work. So thank you very much, uh, Olivier and, and Andrew, and, and in fact, the whole team. That was a, a team effort, and uh, congratulations um, to all of you. Now, I would like to invite Dr. Joseph Chevel. He's the president of the Galilee International Management Institute uh, from Israel. First of all, we give him, we give him two jobs now. His first job will be to officially launch the Kenya Food Security Simulator. And as Olivier have said, please take a look. Uh, there are postcards on your table. There is a QR code. Please go take a look um, at the tool yourself today and in the, in the following days. And then I understand uh, Dr. Joseph will also give us an exciting lecture about education and the importance of it, so thank you very much, and I'll I'll leave the floor to you. Okay, you want to launch the simulator? We want you so to say nice nice yes. things. So <laughs> the simulator, the I launch the simulator first time in the world. Uh -huh. Okay, so I know it's a uh, late. I'll talk fast, I'll talk fast. And I, uh, uh, in the panel, this gentleman here asked me uh, a question. I was a panelist in the afternoon, and he asked me about Moses. Moses went up the, the mountain, came down from the mountain, and all kind. And you reminded me the story of Moses. Moses, as you know, he was the leader in Egypt. And he told God, let my people go out of Egypt. Let my people go out of Egypt. Finally, God told Moses, Moses, where, okay, take your people out of Egypt, but where do you want to take them to? Now, it is written in the Bible that Moses could not talk very well. So when God asked Moses, Moses, where do you want to take your people out of Egypt? Moses said, so God said, okay, take your people to Canaan. Canaan, Canaan is the old name of Israel. But now we think maybe when God asked Moses, Moses, where do you want to take your people? Moses wanted to say, K -K -K Kenya. <laughs> so you remind me, and here is Moses. <laughs> Moses, please stand up, Moses. <laughs> Here is Moses. <laughs> Moses just came back from our institute and uh, <laughs> Okay. Oh. Who said education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world? Who said it? Nelson Mandela. And if we look at Israel, and I'll do it fast, we see that Israel is, is still investing in education. We were lucky that 75 years ago, 75 years ago, in the, uh, our independence, the first prime minister, his name was Ben Gurion, one of the first decisions that he made, a poor country, desert, arid land, the, the, the decision was that every child must go to school. And if the child is not going to school, the father is going to jail. And he threw some fathers to jail. And today, we enjoy this decision that, that Israel is most advanced, and I'll show you just some examples because of this decision, and until today, every child must go to school. Now, if you look here to Kenya, Kenya in 1960 was at the level of India and China. Now, look at this. China and India, and mostly in India, and I'll show you, they invest in education. And also, here is Korea. Korea compared with Ghana. Ghana and Korea, South Korea, of course, they were at the same socioeconomic level in the 1958, 60. And look at this, Ghana remained at the same level and Korea invested in education. Korea doesn't have any gold or bauxite like Ghana. And if we look at education, higher education, so unfortunately we have here the Asia, Europe, North America, the number of universities, and look at Africa. Really sad. Now back to Israel. Israel is uh, in the Middle East and you can see very, very small country. In fact, we, <laughs> we are the size of one of the counties here. We went in Turkana. Turkana is four times bigger than Israel. 
four times bigger. Israel is such a small country, and already today we talked about it, that half of it is desert. Not semi-desert, desert. And still, and the, by the way, we don't have any gold, any natural resources, oil. Now we have some gas in the Mediterranean, and for many, many years, Israelis were complaining to him. What kind of promised land is this? No water, no gold, no oil. Oil, all the oil is around us. Israel is the only country in the Middle East with no oil. Maybe Lebanon. No, now Lebanon even uh, in the sea. But because we invested in education, look at this. This is the, 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 the economy of Israel. is larger than all our neighbors together with the oil. Why? Because we invested in education. And if we combine it to Kenya, Kenya with almost 50 million people, and we are only 10 million people. 10 million people with 400, and Kenya is only with 100. 9.5, we uh, think it's close to uh, 10 million. One word about climate change. First of all, we can see that uh, since 1900, we went up full degree and this is, we can see the Sahel. The Sahel is going down south, and the deputy governor of Marsabet came to Galilee. Unfortunately, he died. And he told me that 40% of the livestock in Marsabet already died. And we participated many years ago in a study of USAID in East Africa, and we found out that one of the risks is that the lake the big lake, Lake Victoria, is shrinking. It might even disappear one day. It's unbelievable. Can we think of, of Lake Victoria disappearing? But if you look at this, the red is the number of population every 10 years, 1980, 1990. Look at this, 1990, 2000. And it's increasing. And today we have about 30 million already living around the lake, and the lake is shrinking. And look at this. This is Lake Chad. In 1972, the size of Israel, 20,000 square kilometers, Lake Chad, and today, dry, totally dry. So this climate change, this is changing length of growing period. And we can see that Western Kenya is going to, to, uh, to be affected, and this is the the I don't want to go into all those numbers, but here, part of it, Kenya is in the green, so it's uh, going to increase. But here we have, this is UN, that reduction up to 50% in the agricultural production, including Kenya, Ghana, Ethiopia, and Cameroon. On top of everything, deforestation. You cut trees. Cut trees, and not only do you cut trees, those, those trees that remain, look at them. So we don't call them countries. Now in the world, the average, the Sweden is number one. In the average, in Africa is 23%. Uganda, 15%. Kenya, 6%. Only 6% of Kenya is covered by trees. And it used to be covered by trees. And then I get to water. Now look at this. All over Africa, since the year 1990 until 2025, the amount of water in every country is about half. And if we look at Kenya, look here, this is Kenya, half, half of the water. And we talked about it this, this morning. And here, this is the former governor of Tana River. He, he, he studied at our institute, Dado. I know the present governor is also Dado, but here we are talking about the previous one. And he invited me with my wife we, uh, we, we just didn't know that it takes six hours for Malindi to drive in the sand. But we went there and we saw that there is a lot of water in Tana River. I mentioned it today. Tana River, and they don't use the water. And the same with Mzima Springs in Tan Taita Taveta, that the water goes. And uh, this is uh, Professor Michieka. We worked with him on water, water management, because it is possible, and I'll show you in a minute if we, it is possible. This is Blue Economy in November 2018, and I was the keynote speaker in Nairobi. Now, please listen carefully. This is the area most risked as a, a from climate change. 
And if we look at this, we can see in Nigeria, maybe Boko Haram, Northeast Nigeria, we see Darfur, we see Somali, the Shabab here along the coast. Maybe all of those problems and terror is because of lack of water. And in fact, in Syria, you know, there were 10 years of civil war. Half a million people were killed, three million refugees, and mostly because of water, because there were a few years of drought, plus the Turks put some dams, there was no water. Farmers cannot continue to cultivate their land. They move to the cities, they, they, they think they will find jobs, they don't find jobs, they start crying. They want to eat, so they steal food. That's how it all started, not only that. There are, there will be civil wars in Africa by 2030 because of lack of water. Because if there is no water, so farmers are moving. But that's what I mentioned today, and I want to show you, that we reuse water. 9% of our water, and I think this is the most important message. If we do it in Israel, we can do it in Kenya, we can do it in Marsabed, we can do it everywhere. Reuse of water, 90% of reuse of water. Israel is number one in the world. Number two is Spain with only 17%. USA, only 5% is reused. But if we do it, we can do it. And this is what we teach in our water management programs. And this is the agriculture. Agriculture is now watered in Israel only with reused water. I mentioned already that it is safe even to drink this water when we reuse, but nobody wants to drink water from sewage, of course. And there is dripping. The dripping system was also developed in Israel in the desert. Now, these are just pictures in the desert. Look at it. The desert is blooming. And it's all, these are cherry tomatoes from the desert, grapes from the desert. These are lemons with no seeds in the desert. Of course, oranges. Oranges in the desert, lemon here, lemon, melon. Even we have peace agreement with Jordan, and we give Jordan, this is a, Prime Minister Rabin, who was assassinated, unfortunately, and the King Hussein, Sea of Galilee, they signed an agreement, and since then, Israel is giving, giving them the 50 million of uh, cubic feet of, li of water. We don't have enough water, but we give to Jordan, even they are in a worse situation. The last group that came to Galilee, just you see, March 2020, before COVID, they were almost stuck in Israel because they stopped all the flights where uh, water management here from Kenya, they came uh, 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 and one of our alumni who also died, uh, the former minister of uh, education and uh, uh, here is Mebiti, also an alumni. Now we signed an agreement with the Council of Governors. This was in 2016, but we re-signed again in 2018 with uh, Governor Nanok, who is also alumni. And we, Nanok, Nanok, selected uh, 10 uh, uh, experts, they came to Galilee, we worked with them on water management, plus a model how to turn Turkana, and remember, Turkana is four times bigger than Israel, Turkana to a flourishing garden. Of course, because of COVID, we had to stop, but now we have another alumni who is the PS of water, and he came to Galilee just uh, in May. He was a, he was a, together with the president that came and visited uh, Israel, so he came. And now we are going to work again on water management, and I'm telling you, we can turn all those arid and semi-arid to gardens. If we do it in Israel, we can do it here. Here, for example, this is Midland State University in Zimbabwe. This is the uh, uh, Vice Chancellor Bebe, and uh, they are bordering Namibia. The desert is moving from Namibia into Zimbabwe. How do you stop it? by water management. So we have a nine month program, diploma on water management in six weeks. And the same with, I mentioned it this morning, this is the worst desert in the world in Eastern uh, 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 Ethiopia. Also the president of Liberia, former president of Liberia came to us and we had, I must, I don't remember what I told her with my finger like this, but she replied, also, <laughs> we, we probably talked about him uh, because uh, I don't know if you know, but in Israel, when you talk to him, we say it's a local call. 
it's not international like from here. Even in the uh, north of Nigeria, which is the Sahara, the worst desert. So this is Kano State. This is the governor. We had an agreement before Corona. This is a Kano State government with the Galilee Institute and the, the another state. Now we are involved in a project, World Bank project in uh, in uh, 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 in Nigeria. This is the for your former president came to us. We had dinner together and we talked about water management. Here I was lecturing about talk, uh, 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 water management and now even you, you uh, a new president, he came last month, we had dinner together and I explained to him and he was very interested. In fact, uh, since Nanok, our alumni is at the State House, so uh, they wanted me to come but I said I'm busy, I'm coming to Kipra. So uh, <laughs> maybe next time. <laughs> so this is a, uh, now, one word about dairy, because today we talked about livestock. The Israeli cow is giving 50 liters of milk per day, 50, five zero, 50. And, uh, and uh, when I walk around, I was in uh, Samburu, and uh, I saw a cow, cow is giving two, three liters a day. Now a cow is a cow. What is the difference? <laughs> the and indeed, one of our alumni from Nieri County, Matu Amai, unfortunately passed away recently. He came to one of the programs. He established a school. He established a school in Nieri County. We helped him to establish the school. And farmers in the region came to the school. Now the same cows, within one year, one year, the same cows, uh, double the amount of milk. The same cows, the same equipment, double the amount of, of uh, uh, milk. And uh, the, we even have a small uh, 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 Chuka, Chuka University in uh, uh, near Mary. The vice chancellor, former vice chancellor, he ran to be, the, he wanted to be the governor, but he failed. So the former vice chancellor, he established a dairy farm in the university. For, he sent four faculty members to us, they came back, they established, and they trained the farmers, and that's it. By training or by education, the production is increasing. Dates. Even Uganda, your neighbor, this is a former prime minister, but she is alumni of our institute. She is now the prime minister, and she is uh, our alumni, and <coughs> we signed an agreement for agriculture and water, and 500 trainees that they want to uh, send. This is the, the Minister of Finance and myself. We signed the agreement. Uh, she is uh, also an alumni of Galilee. Ethiopia, the same thing. This was uh, before Corona. Now we are, uh, uh, maybe I should mention in Ethiopia because it's relevant to Kenya. In Ethiopia, you know, we want to change agriculture. Agriculture in the 21st century must be digital. Digital agriculture. So, and in Israel it is g digital, and I don't want to go into uh, examples. Everything is computerized nowadays. And this is why youngsters want to work in agriculture, because it's not like our grandparents that used to plow. Agriculture today is computers. So in Ethiopia, we have a program for 10,000 girls, because it's jointly with the Ministry of Gender and Social Affairs, 10,000 girls in five years. That they are, we are teaching them online from Israel by our professors and, but we hire local lecturers or professors that help them. So it's online and on site and all around the country. All around the country they have a, they like, not counties, they call it states. This is also in Ghana, I don't want to go about Ghana, but the same thing, 3,000 students in Ghana, digital agriculture. And this is South Sudan, the World Bank approved just uh, May 25th approve the program. This is the Minister of uh, Science and Technology in uh, South Sudan, and we start in September. One word about post-harvest, because today it was mentioned, and uh, uh, here it's written one-third. One-third, the production is already poor, so can you imagine one-third is wasted? One-third of the production. FAO, which is the Food and Agriculture of the United Nations, says it's 50%. 50% of the production is never reaches the market, which is unbelievable. 
But here in Israel, we have post-harvest management, and we reduce it to few, few uh, percent, percent. And here we have long shelf cherry tomatoes. So also, we have a program on post-harvest, and we teach the Israeli, we want to share the knowledge. It's not a secret. Now, one, one secret of Israel that I have to show is that we are number one in the world in research and development. Research and 4.5 of our economy is going to research and development. And it's not that the government is doing the research, but it's the private sector. Most managers, when they, let's say that they have a profit, they don't take all the profit to their pocket. They understand that part of it it ha we have to invest in the product. And because of, because we, are, we have so much research, no wonder that we have already 12 Nobel Prize. Here, chemistry, 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 economics, chemistry, chemistry, everything because education and research and development. And in Israel is, in fact, considered to be a startup nation. Did you know that the cell phone that everybody has here was developed in Israel? And here, Microsoft, we have research centers almost every, every, I'll go fast. No, but here, most NT and XT that every one of us has in his or her computer was developed in Israel. And please remember, less than 10 million people, only because of education. Here, this is the NASDAQ. In the NASDAQ, you have 63, it's not updated, but 63 companies, high-tech companies, here, what is it? even the UK, four. India, three. Here, China, China zero. They, they only copy. Now, <laughs> here is, they, <laughs> Intel, can you imagine 40%, 40% of the, the research of Intel worldwide is done in Israel. And Apple, Apple never had any uh, research center outside of the uh, US, and now it's uh, here in, in Haifa. Even space, but space, Israel is one of the uh, uh, countries that launch uh, 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 to space. But what I wanted to show you, this is an Israeli satellite, but this is also an Israeli satellite. This is a real satellite that was developed in school. School by school kids, school students. Now, even in health, today they said, uh, uh, someone mentioned health, so this, this is, a uh, given imagine in if, if I have a problem in my, my stomach. So instead of open, I can swallow a pill with a small camera and the pill take pictures inside and broadcast outside. Since we are, I wanted to tell you that it was developed by a military engineer. That they developed a missile with a small camera that when you shoot the missile, the camera takes pictures, broadcasts back. So the same idea, try to use your imagination. The same idea, a small me medical pill with a small camera, you swallow, and it takes pictures. And this is the picture of our stomach, inside the stomach. Instead of opening to see what is wrong, here I have a picture. Now today, I hope you will not lose your appetite. Uh, now today you talked about the sun. So you know that in Israel since 1950, 50, every house must have solar panels on the house. Without this, you cannot get a permit for the house since 1950s. So of course here is a, or now they start on the sea, but I wanted to show you that this is a, in the south, in the desert, and today you mentioned that in the desert you don't have cloud, you have the sun all the time. Look at these thousands of mirrors, thousands of mirrors that follow the sun, and they, they send the beam to the tower. Look at this, the tower, and it's, it produces electricity for a city of 120,000 people. Full electricity, everything sun by sun. One word about national security, because uh, today also someone mentioned the, uh, uh, here we are in a <laughs> this region, and uh, so Galilee Institute was also a member, until COVID, member of Kenya, Ethiopia, Uganda. Here, I don't know if you know, General Koech, 
in the middle, he was the chief of staff of Kenya, and this is the Peace Institute in Karen in Nairobi, and uh, 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 we meet every year. I will go fast, and we also, we also work in other regions. And I want to tell you that they have the same problems. For example, this is in Russia. Russia, I should not talk about Russia, but we, we also, <laughs> We also work with them, and uh, they also have problems on water management. But here, for example, this is uh, 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 Modi, the prime minister of, uh, of uh, uh, India, and I'm sitting uh, behind him signing an agreement because Modi decided that he wants to double the agricultural production in his term. So he came to us, and we prepared a plan. We had to stop because of COVID, but now they want to uh, talk again, and this is a... Uh, some of his, uh, uh, China again, China, big China. They come to us and for years, every five years, we sign an agreement with China. They come to learn about water management, about innovation in agriculture. And, uh, and the last thing is uh, the, the Western Hemisphere. We also have an agreement with the American Organization of American State in Washington, Latin America. This is the Middle East, but I will go fast because this is uh, 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 not important. I want to get to the main risk. What is the main risk? Immigration of farmers to the cities. And this is why the transportation in Nairobi is so bad. And yes, because farmers are immigrating and we have to teach the farmers how they want to stay in their farm, but uh, we have to teach them how, how to have water and how to be more productive, how to be able to compete. So we have these programs of doubling agricultural production in three years, and we do it in eight disciplines. I will not go agribusiness, dairy, dairy that I mentioned, horticulture, poultry, fishery. Fishery, here you have the ocean. Post-harvest uh, fruits. Can you imagine? Here is a agriculture, dairy, a post-harvest that I mentioned. And look at this. Flowers, flowers, horticulture. Just for Valentine's Day, just for Valentine's Day 2017, Israel sent 60 million flowers to Europe. Just for Valentine's Day. You can do it from here. It's, you can compete in Naivasha or wherever you can. Uh, now look at Kenya. Kenya in the year 2050 will be 100 million people, almost. How are you going to feed them? Not only that, look around you. Nigeria is going to be 900 million. This is in 2100. Ethiopia, 240. They will start marching to Kenya. Uganda, 200 million. And look, look at this, please. Nairobi, can you see Nairobi? Nairobi today is 1.3, 1.2, 1.2 million. And in the year 2050, Nairobi will be 15 million people. 15 million people. What can we do? So the main thing, the, my message is, first of all, it is possible. If we do it in Israel, if we do it in other places, we can do it here in Kenya. And it is possible. This is the main message. We can also work on doubling the uh, agricultural production. Of course, reuse of water. It's so simple. In water management, maybe we will start really in, uh, in uh, uh, Turkana. Also, we have this digital, I, I, will, uh, I want to uh, uh, tell you about this program. When the uh, when new president came to Israel and I met so the principal secretary of the ICT, came with him. And when he heard about this program in Ethiopia and South Sudan, he said, I want it also in Kenya. And we met in Nairobi yesterday or the day before, and we developed the, the following program. 2,000 students, one third will be girls, and there will be 40 per county. Every county, you have 47, let's say 50. So 2,000 divided by 40, and the 50, uh, uh, 50, 50 counties, and we will teach online. This is a two-year program on digital agriculture. We will teach online 
including lecturers from here, from the universities, and, and we'll have study center in each uh, uh, county. And first of all, this will be the force. This will be the group that will pull this country upward to make Kenya digital. Not only that, we are also committed to employ at least 10% of the graduates in Israeli high tech companies, but they will work online. This is a new world. You sit here, you work online. And we have a commitment from Israeli high tech companies to employ the, uh, uh, of course, the salary is a little less the, than in Israel. So uh, they, uh, uh, they will do So this is the program that we want to start in September and it's really pushing Kenya upward. And the last thing that I want to say is about solar, which is a must. The sun is the same sun, the same price, which is zero. And, <laughs> and, and I saw the sun here. So thank you very much. Bon appetit and shalom. Shall I announce uh, Thank you. Thank you. I think there are only very few people in the world who can entertain people so well and keep them away from dinner for half an hour at that time of the day. So thank you so much. This was a great speech. And I think we are all very convinced about the importance of, of education and, and thank you for sharing this. Um, Rose, would you like to say the magic words about the buffet and uh, the dinner that we are all waiting for? Okay. Please, thank you, thank you very much. Um, thank you very much uh, for uh, Joseph for that uh, uh, stimulating uh, discussion. Uh, what did he tell us? It is, it is, it is possible even to have dinner now. Welcome, thank you. Thank you very much uh, for that. Uh, we want to manage how we are going to take the dinner. And uh, we are going to start uh, with this table and that one at the back there so that we can go systematically. Uh, we're starting with this one and the other one there. You go there, you get some, and then you come back. And then from there, we will say,